Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. This is a great pleasure and honor uh, for me to come here tonight and to share with you uh, our views uh, about the future of energy. You will see, I will try to provide some answers, but also some uh, questions, some uncertainties I'm uh, going to uh, underline. But one thing perhaps uh, I should mention uh, that uh, Mr. Rector underlined. I am, uh, by training, I am an engineer. I'm an electrical engineer. I know that Imperial College is uh, one of the top schools in that respect. But the other day, I noticed something. I am, uh, my office is called Office of the Chief Economist. I'm when you, uh, which is preparing this outlook, World Energy Outlook, with the help of many, many colleagues in the IEA. One of them is here, I think, uh, Neil Hurst, who was at the IEA, who was uh, one of the key pillars of the providing such uh, work. But when I look at my colleagues, uh, about 80% in the Office of the Chief Economist have an uh, engineering background. So this is a bit uh, interesting. So and I am called the Chief Economist, but I, my first degree was engineering, then I went to economist. So I think it is very important, the engineering education, the background we get there, the formation we got there is very, very important to have a solid view of the energy uh, and uh, other economic uh, issues. What I will try to do today, first, I want to look at the energy picture and then move to the uh, climate change within the next uh, half an hour and so on the basis of the, our likely scenario, how we see the global energy picture uh, could uh, look like and what are the implications of that. When we look at the, the future of energy demand, we see that the OECD countries, so-called the industrialized world, their energy demand is more or less stable. When we look at the, where the growth comes from, I think there are five countries for me. Uh, which are the drivers of the growth, energy demand growth, namely China, 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 <laughs> India, and Middle East, in that order. Three times the China, one time the India, and one time the Middle East. These are the drivers of the global energy demand, and rightly so, rightly so, because their economies are growing, population is uh, uh, growing, and their current energy consumption on a per capita basis is much lower than the OECD countries. I said China, but when you look at China's current consumption uh, uh, today, energy consumption today, it is about one-fourth of the United States. And 25 years of time, when China becomes a, a huge energy giant in terms of consumption, it will be still one third of the even OECD countries uh, average. So there is all justification of China, India uh, 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 growing there. And when you look at on a fuel by fuel basis, you see some surprises. In terms of the coal and oil, in the OECD countries, we expect a decline in the use. Only among the fossil fuels, we expect gas to increase in the OECD countries, and all the growth in other fuels come from the so-called developing countries or emerging countries. So there are three major drivers of this huge growth coming from the developing countries. One I mentioned, economic growth. Energy is very important for economic growth and a better life. Uh, unfortunately, in some cases, in some uh, countries, in some contexts, energy has some negative connotation, but energy is a very good thing if you use it wisely, if you produce it wisely. It is good for your life, it's good for the economy, it is for the convenience in terms of mobility, lighting, and the other things. So, the first reason why, why it is coming from emerging countries is economy is develop developing, therefore you need energy. Second reason, Population is growing, more people, more energy. But there's a third reason, which is not as innocent and as perhaps well justified like the first two reasons. Namely, there are substantial subsidies, fossil fuel subsidies in many countries. According to our analysis in the year 2009, 
there are more than 300 billion subsidies, uh, value of subsidies in the uh, many countries in a uh, developing world. And subsidies make the uh, energy uh, products cheaper, therefore under their value, therefore it leads to wasteful use. If something is lower than it is value, if something is very cheap, think about our ho homes, households, we tend to use it in a very wasteful manner. If something is expensive, we are much more careful how we use it. So therefore, the cheap energy leads to wasteful use of energy and therefore energy efficiency in many of these countries are very, very poor. But at the same time, uh, I observe that in some countries there are significant efforts to reduce the subsidies. Iran made some uh, significant efforts very recently. Uh, China, India, they are making some efforts. And one thing I should mention to you, when you look at many countries, they say, we have the subsidies to protect the poor. And this is wrong. Subsidies are mainly, or subsidized energy is mainly used by the medium and higher income levels. Because they are the ones who use the most of the commercial energy. And as I will show you in a couple of minutes of time, the poor segments of the population in developing countries use other sources of energy, so-called non-commercial energy uh, uh, services. So uh, we are pushing the phase out of subsidies as cheap fossil fuels also block the way for alternative energy sources to find a, a room in the energy mix and uh, blocking those. If I can tell you a couple of things about the oil markets, which is very important uh, nowadays because of the prices. Now, what drives the oil demand today is transportation sector, cars, trucks, and jets. And again, China is a major driver. When we look at the global oil demand, we expect more than half of the growth in global oil demand will come from China only. And again, this is very well justified. In Europe today, uh, 500 uh, person out of 1,000 person own a car. In the United States, over 700 person out of 1,000 person own a car. And in China, which became the largest car market in 2010, only 30 person out of 1,000 person own a car. So if you compare uh, Europe and China, 30 out of 1,000 versus 500 out of 1,000. And when China becomes, for example, in 2035, a huge oil importer with all its consequences, I will come to this consequence in a minute. Chinese per capita consumption, uh, per capita car ownership will be 240 people out of 1,000. So in 2035, when China becomes a huge oil importer, Chinese per capita car ownership will be half of Europe of today. It means it is very well justified what China is doing. If we look at the example of Europe or United States, China is doing only what we have been doing in the last uh, couple of decades. Whether or not this is right or wrong, this is other debate, but there is no way whatsoever one should blame China because of the growing oil demand. They are just following the model that uh, OECD countries have been uh, uh, developing. Now, this, why it is important? that the oil demand is coming from transportation sector. This is very important to understand this because the understand this issue has implications up to geopolitics. <clears throat> it is important for the following reason. In the past, remember, perhaps some of you don't remember but can, uh, must have read, the two oil shocks we had in the 70s. At that time, we were using oil. Oil demand was coming from different sectors of uh, economy. Namely, we were using oil for 
generating electricity. We were using oil for uh, heating at home or for industry, uh, uh, for the processes. And when prices went up, we were able to switch from oil to other energy sources. For example, in the electricity generation now, almost nobody, uh, uh, except for some uh, oil producing countries, nobody uses oil. We were able to switch to nuclear, renewables, coal, gas, and the other things. Again, for heating at home, very little homes now use uh, fuel oil. They switch to natural gas, electricity, and other things. But when it comes to transportation sector, you do not have currently readily available alternatives to oil products. Very weak options we have now. It means even though the prices go up, you may not be able to see a significant reaction on the demand side to lower the demand because the, uh, you cannot put coal in the tank of your car or wind or something else, at least with the current technologies we have. This is very important as a strategic issue. This is the Achilles heel of many energy consuming uh, nations. Demand will grow. And we saw that demand grew significantly in 2010-11, despite the economic crisis, mainly, as I said, coming from China and other developing countries. Now, the question is whether or not we have enough supply, production on the oil side to bring it and to meet that demand uh, uh, growth. So on the side of the... Uh, we say the, I don't want to go too much uh, in technical terms here, but the many fields, oil fields today we have in North Sea, for example, in United States and in many countries are in decline. This is uh, bad news. There is still oil in Middle East countries, but there will be a change of the uh, oil industry picture. So-called big oil, some of them are in this country and in the United States and elsewhere, they are all, or most of them, are in an identity crisis, if I may say so. Why? Because while they own the fields they have now, they booked, are in decline, they do not have much possibility to access new reserves. There are reserves in the Middle East, but in many countries, by law, by constitution, foreigners cannot go and invest there. It can be only carried out by the national oil companies. So it is the reason why you see some international oil companies are looking at some options to work with some uh, countries, companies outside of their countries, some joint ventures, some deals and mergers, and some of them Moving from a, a being an international oil company, they are moving to natural gas as a new uh, business uh, option. So therefore, uh, we expect that the oil markets uh, will be tighter and uh, tighter. And the, in terms of uh, countries, when we look at it, the, almost all the growth will need to come from the very few number of producers, especially in the Middle East. Saudi Arabia, a very important oil country, is key for all of us here. But there is one country which is crucial for the next few years for the global oil markets. What happens in that country? Namely, Iraq. Global oil markets, looking at the developments on the demand side, looking at the uh, supply picture in many countries, cannot afford a failure of increase of production in Iraq. This is very crucial for all of us. And we all know that there are many challenges in Iraq to increase the production, ranging from political stability in the country to some logistical problem, infrastructure problems, availability of water, availability of uh, skilled uh, 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 labor. There's a lot of oil, a lot of gas, but to bring it under the earth to the 
pump stations in, in Shanghai, in, 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 in the UK, in the United States is another issue. So therefore, Iraq's failure of increasing production would be a very bad news for all of us. We, therefore, looking at the demand and supply uh, picture, how strong the demand growth potential is and how the supply picture looks like, the decline in the many of the fields and very few number of countries are increasing production, I can tell you that uh, we have to prepare ourselves with higher price context, which I think is a bad news, especially when the global economy nowadays is trying to recover. Let me tell you why I think that the, it is a bad news, especially nowadays. This, is, this picture shows you the import bill of uh, three OECD region, United States, Europe, and uh, uh, Japan, how much they pay to the oil import bill, and what is the ratio of oil import bill to their uh, GDP. In the year 2008, when we had the financial crisis, some of you may remember that the oil prices were very high, about uh, $90, and many economists thought that the high oil prices were uh, a key reason for the financial crisis. This is a debate. But at least many people accept that if not the main driver, the uh, high oil prices play their role in the run-up to the financial crisis by weakening the trade balance, the, uh, weakening the purchasing power of businesses and uh, uh, households, and uh, others. In the year 2008, when we went through that, that uh, uh, very awful, I should say, uh, days of the uh, uh, European and uh, OECD and global economy, in Europe, for example, the share of oil import bill, the GDP ratio was 2.2%. And in 2011, if the oil prices remain around $100, we have more or less the same level, 2.2%. So we come to the level of the 2008 if the oil prices are about uh, $100 for Europe and for US and Japan, a similar uh, picture. So therefore, uh, it is rather important to keep an eye on the oil prices and their uh, implications. Let me move to another few which I think is a uh, major changes are happening, namely uh, natural gas. <clears throat> natural gas uh, demand is worldwide increasing and the main drivers are here, China and uh, Middle East countries uh, uh, themselves, and they are the uh, major uh, drivers. Now, for the colleagues who are not familiar with the natural gas markets, let me tell you a couple of things. What happened in the United States a few years ago is that unexpectedly by uh, uh, many, for many people, United States increased its domestic gas production through unconventional gas, uh, we call it say shale gas under, under the rock. And, uh, this meant a lot of things. Namely, everybody was thinking that the United States will import huge amount of natural gas because their demand was increasing and their production was declining to meet the gap. US would uh, import a lot of gas. And as a result of this huge revolution in the United States, increase of the uh, unconventional gas U.S. doesn't need to import gas at all, or very little, which means there is a lot of exporters of gas countries who thought that they would sell gas to the United States and carry out major projects in North America, pardon, North Africa, in uh, Gulf countries, and in the former Soviet Union countries, but US doesn't need it. 
But these projects are coming. This gas is coming in the picture. So what is happening is that there is a lot of gas in the markets now. We call it gas glut. So lots of gas looking for uh, buyers in many uh, countries. And we expect that there will be, at least in Europe, for several years, there will be an oversupply of gas. Now, this has two implications, many implications, but at least two of them. And it may be, for some of the colleagues here, good news. For some of us, it may be a bad news. One of them is, in Europe, 75% of the gas trade, gas prices, gas imports, are made by uh, long-term contracts, which are indexed to oil prices. It means when oil prices go up, gas prices go up with a time lag, and when oil prices go down, uh, gas prices also go down with a time, uh, six months or uh, uh, whatever. Now, since there's a lot of gas in the market now, many importers of gas are pushing to move away from the, and knowing that oil prices will be higher and increasing, they are pushing strongly the gas exporters to move away from the oil price index uh, uh, formula, to put some more market elements in the uh, gas uh, pricing, which is a bad news for gas exporters, especially one major gas exporter and others. So this is one issue, and this can, ladies and gentlemen, change the gas picture substantially. Second, lower gas prices mean strong competition for the many <coughs> competitors. One, for example, for renewable energies, because gas is, if it is cheap, and since we know that gas, uh, CO2 emission from gas is much lower than uh, coal and lower than oil, there are many utilities looking at the gas option carefully and uh, renewables may be badly affected. United States, when we look at United States, for example, in the year 2010, when the new administration took to office, one of the first things they did was to push the uh, renewable energies have uh, put a few policies in place, but in the year 2010, renewable energy investments in the United States went down by 50 percent, five zero. The main reason here, there are two reasons. One is the cheap gas availability compared to renewable energies, and the second is the the budget deficit that some of the states are fa uh, facing and not being able to continue to support the renewable energies. And I am afraid that the cheap gas, availability of cheap gas, may be a reason for many new technologies, such as the carbon capture and storage, fading away of the appetite which could be wrong. But this is how the short-sighted markets are, and this is where we see that the uh, cheap gas may well have implications, so one should be very, very uh, careful. Now, from uh, gas, let me move to coal. In Europe, we don't talk about coal much, but this doesn't mean that the coal is Coal growth is not taking place, just the opposite. Coal is growing very strongly, uh, but the uh, growth is not in Europe. Coal is still the backbone of the electricity generation. In the OECD countries, we do not expect coal to grow, uh, uh, decline, especially coal-fired power plants. Uh, in India, a bit of a growth, but the main growth comes from China about 600 gigawatt. So this is huge. This is, uh, the, uh, it is equal to the 
current capacity of uh, coal capacity of US plus Europe plus uh, Japan. And this has major implications. Uh, in the year uh, 2007, we made a, a book on the inverted energy outlook on China, India. And uh, John McNaught, who, who is here with us today, she was the chair of our uh, governing board, she would remember. We said in that book, looking at the China, China will soon be a, a coal importer. And people, I mean, we had uh, smiles in the people's face because China was a major coal country. Today, China imports coal, and China imports only 3% of its needs, and as a result, before the importing, coal prices were about $60, and today they are about $130 per ton. Again, I underline, when you look at the electricity consumption per capita, China is much lower than the OECD countries. It's all the right of China to increase its electricity uh, uh, generation, but this is the uh, uh, consequence. So, let me move after coal to another uh, fuel, uh, which is renewables. We expect renewable energies, uh, hydropower, wind, solar, uh, biofuels, to grow entire world, and uh, which is, uh, especially in electricity generation, which is a very good news in terms of uh, climate change and in terms of energy security. This is definitely a very good news. However, in order to renewables to grow as the uh, project, there is a need for continuation of government support in different forms. We have uh, calculated that the current renewable subsidies uh, worldwide are uh, very strong and they are going to uh, increase with the increase of the uh, renewable uh, energies. They're about uh, $60 billion uh, dollar, uh, today. The cost of generating renewables are going to decline, but since we will have more renewables, the subsidies will uh, increase. Now, as I said, renewables now facing major challenges, even in the countries who were the pioneers of the penetration of renewables in the energy markets because of the deficits that many of them have in their budgets, difficult to continue to subsidize renewable energies, and second, as I said, natural gas is becoming a very important alternative to renewable energies in terms of clean electricity uh, generation. So therefore, uh, I think uh, we will see that the, uh, in the next years, in many countries, there will be strong debates between the energy or climate ministers and uh, finance ministers how we are going to continue with the renewable schemes. Let me tell you a few things, another side of the coin about China. When we look at the Clean energy technologies, I told you up to now, oil, coal, gas, China is the main driver in those fossil energies. But when we look at the clean energy technologies, in terms of capacity additions in the next 25 years, China is by far the number one in the world. Solar, wind, nuclear, or in terms of the uh, so-called uh, advanced car technologies, electric cars. What does it mean? It means the following. First, it's a good news because if China brings a lot of new capacity in the markets and huge amount of wind, solar, and, and the others, the cost of production will go down. Economies of scales, learning by doing. China will bring the cost of production. It's a good news for all of us because we want clean energy technologies to be cheaper. This is definitely a good news. But there's other side of the story. Then this means by bringing the cost down, China may be now the champion 
and the major exporter of these new technologies. Today we see that, for example, in the case of uh, wind energy, Chinese wind turbines are much cheaper, even when they bring it to Europe, plus the transportation costs, and many uh, pioneer companies have difficulties to compete with the Chinese. Or electric cars. If China, as we see uh, here, becomes the champion in terms of electric cars, and they have a very a strong program, China, in terms of electric car manufacturing, then uh, if China becomes the champion here, then uh, the question is what will happen to the current champions in terms of car manufacturing? Germany, France, United States, Japan. Today, 3% of the GDP in Europe comes from a uh, car industry. About 8% of the employment comes from car manufacturing. So what will be the implications of China's taking over as the leading car manufacturing? This will have some trade implications that we need to uh, see. A topic that we look into very carefully in our uh, work this year in the region is Caspian region. We expect that both in terms of oil and in terms of gas, Caspian region will be more and more an important uh, source of energy and diversification of energy, especially in the oil. Kazakhstan, with it is a few giant and super giant fields, will increase the production, which is a very good news. And in terms of gas, especially from Turkmenistan, but also from Azerbaijan, there may be an increase of gas production. The current gas production in that region, which is about 100 BCM, may be well tripled. And this is uh, only our uh, projections for Turkmenistan, for example, is only half of Turkmen government's uh, targets. So what does 300 BCM means for the colleagues who look at the gas issues? It means three new Norway, which is not bad at all. But now, where will the gas go? Again, I will come here uh, to Europe's uh, uh, situation. In Europe, as far as I remember, since 20 years, we, think, we discuss what is the best route to bring the Caspian gas to Europe. There are many different routes, A, B, or C. And this discussion is continuing. Lots of uh, memorandum of understandings, intention letters, left and right meetings, etc. But China, since this, although uh, uh, while these 20 years of discussions continuing, China, three and a half years ago, sit on the table with Turkmen government, and today, Turkmen gas is flowing to China. They made their discussion, agreement, financing, engineering, and the gas is flowing now. What I want to say here is that there is a competitor to Caspian Energy, and in more uh, globally, uh, Russia as well, to Europe, uh, China coming there. And this is definitely good news before everybody for those producing countries as they have at least two clients that they can uh, uh, compete and they can discuss and they have a maneuver room there. Before going to climate change, one issue which may not seem as a issue of energy, but it is at the heart of the interest, as Neil uh, would know. Uh, one of my uh, 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 favorite topics, namely, energy and poor. Today, this is an issue that we follow in the World Energy Outlook since uh, eight years. And our recent analysis that we have presented to the United Nations during the uh, uh, annual uh, summit in September, United Nations, together with Mr. Ban Ki-moon, says that today 1.4 billion people have no electricity. They have never seen electricity, mainly in Sub-Saharan Africa, India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh. 1.4 billion people. So the day finishes for them much earlier than for us. And I think this is one of the best 
a indicator for the inequality between the human beings. In Sub-Saharan Africa, 800 million people, 800 million people, use the consume the same amount of electricity that the people consume in New York City, which is 17 million people. I'm New York, 17 million versus 800 million people here use the same amount of electricity. So I think this is uh, more than energy. This is a bit of a uh, perhaps economic, political, and uh, moral issue. And uh, we believe that this is an unacceptable trend and should be treated as a major issue together with energy security and climate change in the context of global energy uh, picture. Now let me finish uh, uh, the, uh, the, my presentation talking to you a bit on the uh, climate change. The energy trends, which is our uh, likely uh, scenario, brings us, what I told you up to now, a temperature increase of 3.5 degrees Celsius. As you know, energy is the, the main cause of uh, increase in the uh, CO2 emissions, producing and, uh, and using of energy. And 3.5 degrees Celsius is, for many, almost all scientists, ex, uh, considered as unacceptable with major consequences. There are colleagues here who know this issue much better than me. And this is, we were told, this is unacceptable. And then we try to look at it, what needs to happen in the energy sector if we were to come from 3.5 degrees to a 2 degrees level, which is considered to be an acceptable trend. So what we have is that we build a scenario which we call 450 scenario. This is the 450 ppm, the concentration of carbon in the atmosphere, to bring us to a 2 degrees uh, 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 level. And we have looked at all the pledges, all the targets that many countries put on the table after Copenhagen uh, meeting and admitted again once more in Cancun. Many countries said, in the year 2020, I will do this. About more than 100 countries. And we have assumed that they will uh, fulfill that pledge and afterwards making strong actions. What happened in Cancun? I think there is, of course, it is good that there was a commitment, again, to reduce the emissions and commitment to these targets. And uh, that the two degrees is recognized as a uh, goal. But my view is that since no major steps were made in Cancun, we are, I am looking only from the energy perspective, we are only a few inches away to say goodbye to two degrees target. It's very pessimistic, but this is where we are. When you look at the numbers, when you look at the investments going on, when you look what is going on in the energy industry. If there are no major moves very soon, we are going to say goodbye to 450 or 2 degrees uh, target. Coming back to pledges or the targets that the country has put. I am not a climate, climatologist nor a, a negotiator of climate change, but I look at myself with my colleagues, these pledges one by one, and I am amazed. I'm not saying about the lack of ambition, but lack of clarity. Countries say, I am going to reduce my emissions in the year 2020, X percent compared to my business as usual trend. And nobody knows what is their business as usual trend. There is no indication about that. So you cannot say you are lower or higher than your uh, target because there is what is the reference. And this is accepted. There is this is submitted to the United Nations. Or some countries say, I am going to reduce my emissions between X percent and Y percent in 2020. And the difference between X and Y is so huge that it has no meaning to put a target. But these are, and the targets are so big. The, 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 the uncertainties are so big in those targets that the, if you put the uncertainties together, it is higher 
than a, a 3.9 uh, degrees, which is the level that you have to reduce by 2020. <coughs> so, having said that, if you still want to commit to uh, 450, if you want to still make the 450, global CO2 emissions have to peak before 2020, it means in eight years of time. This, is, this seems to me, with the current discussion we have, with the current political conjecture we have, this means to be impossible because of the following reason. I hope uh, all the colleagues are familiar with the concept of decarbonization. So it means the, or the carbon intensity of the, uh, the energy. So this means that the, in the last uh, 15 years or so, global decarbonization of energy each year improved uh, just a bit higher than 1%. Less carbon intensive, or more cleaner, less carbon fuels. If the, all these pledges, which are not legally binding at all, if they were to be fulfilled, which is a big if there, then we need to uh, uh, double decarbonization efforts. This is a huge challenge and a tall order. But it's not the biggest problem. The biggest problem is coming. If we still want to come to 450, we have to once again double the efforts. This is the, you take the most ambitious part of the pledges, which are not legally binding, they will be still fulfilled, and then you have to double those efforts which are iffy, iffy to be fulfilled. And this is a major problem. And this has to take place, bulk of this effort, in the countries where climate change is not top of the agenda or perhaps sometimes not anywhere in the agenda of the, uh, their economic or policy uh, debate. In Europe, I know that there is a huge interest to solve this problem, which I appreciate in terms of intellectual, moral, and uh, also uh, policy leadership. UK is at the top front, at the, at the forefront of this. This is very much appreciated. But what does it mean? Let me give you one example. In Europe, there is a debate whether Europe should reduce the emissions 20% or 30% in the year 2020. Countries are divided into two. Some say 20%, some say 30%. There are meetings, summits, discussions, PhDs, and so on. I can tell you the difference between 20% or 30% of European CO2 emissions are equal to the two weeks of emissions of China. Just two weeks. The emissions two weeks coming from China would cancel out the uh, going from 20 to 30 percent of the uh, European emissions. So therefore, philosophically, it's a very good discussion. <laughs> Leadership of Europe is very important, but we should look at the global impact of this and try to get the other countries on board. If we were to go for the 450, I think the, there are two sectors which are key to make major uh, changes, transformations. One of them is the uh, electricity generation. We have to see a major penetration of the zero or low carbon technologies, such as renewables, nuclear, and carbon capture and storage. And this is a very important part of the 450 or two degrees scenario. The second one is on the transportation sector. Many people think that when we talk about the CO2 emissions, they, they uh, automatically identify or, or uh, that it equal in their mind, make it equal to coal issue, which is right or wrong. It sounds a bit French, but it's right or wrong at the same time. Why it is right or wrong? The coal is definitely a major contributor to CO2 emissions, but the difference between coal and oil is very small. Coal is responsible about 42% of the CO2 emissions, and oil is responsible about 38% of the CO2 emissions. So the difference is not very big. So it means we have to reduce the, the, the oil consumption in a 
450 and 2 degrees uh, uh, scenario by using uh, moving props from an oil-based mobility system to electricity or biofuels or others and improving the energy efficiency. I think this is perhaps a bit more uh, likely uh, 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 sector for a, a good results to happen because there is a, in addition to climate change, there is another driver for a change in the uh, mobility sector and transportation, namely, as I mentioned in the beginning, high oil prices. And that the China is behind the wheel, if I may say so, for going for moving from an oil-based mobility system to an electricity-based mobility system. And if such a scenario happens, if there's a strong penetration of the advanced car technologies, this could also help the oil security. This is the, our, uh, the likely scenario of oil demand growth. I mentioned in the beginning of uh, my remarks. And if you go to a 450, global oil demand can be much lower, comforting the markets, bringing the oil markets down and less uh, tensed. So a strong penetration of the advanced car technologies would not only help to address the climate change issue, but at the same time could provide a solution to uh, oil uh, markets uh, problems. So ladies and gentlemen, let me try to finish uh, really this time my presentation by telling you that there are many policies put in place in the, uh, by uh, many governments to address the energy security and climate change problems, but we shouldn't uh, 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 be misled. We are far from having a sustainable energy futures, even though there are many new policies in uh, place. Once again, the age of cheap oil is over with all its consequences, and the Important countries, consuming countries such as Europe, such as US, such as China, India, Japan, they, they can only have a say in the oil markets through their demand side response, namely making a change in the transportation sector where the, most of the oil is used. Natural gas, we can anytime see a bigger surprise in natural gas. Uh, that can be stronger than many of us expect of penetration of natural gas, and this may have implications on not only in the nature for natural gas markets, export and importance, but also the other fuels in the energy mix. Because energy mix is 100%. If the share of something goes up, the share of some other things may, may need to, uh, or do have to, uh, they have to go down. So there, is a, there should be a competition there. As I mentioned, some fuels, some technologies may suffer from cheaper gas. Renewables are entering the uh, mainstream, uh, being especially driven by uh, wind power and, uh, and others. But in order for them to be viable and competitive, there is a need for continuous support from governments. If governments really want to see higher penetration of renewables, there is a need for a uh, continuation of the support. Finally, there was a lack of uh, ambition, I would say, uh, both in uh, Copenhagen, followed in, in Cancun, and since we did not see an international legally binding agreement in any of these uh, uh, meetings, uh, to achieve a two degrees target is becoming less and less likely. So thank you very much for your attention.